ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानांजन शलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मिलस्मगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिदेशिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतीता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम राम हरे 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 कृष्णा सो ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर अमंग्स ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे एंड आई विल स्पीक ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ एंजाइटी एज इज मेंशनड सो आई विल स्टार्ट विद द क्वेश्चन आई वाज जस्ट एट वन प्लेस एंड दिस डिवोटी दैट सन ही हैड बीन डायग्नोज्ड विद एंजाइटी डिसऑर्डर so then i was talking with him about the situations in which he was used to feel nervous and then we had a long discussion on it so today i'll address specifically the topic is anxiety a disorder anxiety can sometimes be a disorder but i look at it first from a <clears throat> historical perspective then we'll look from a philosophical perspective and then we'll come to some practical analysis so broadly speaking the history of modernization of the world is a history of gaining more and more control over things so today we have comforts available which were unavailable even for kings a few hundred years ago air conditioning can be an example and the whole attempt of the search for knowledge through science and its application through technology is to get more and more control over situations over our circumstances and in many ways that has had desirable effects when it's too hot we can cool the atmosphere at least around us when it's too cold we can make it hot so we have got some control and this attempt to control things Through human capacity, has had an unwanted effect, and that is that we start expecting that we should be able to control things in general. And when we are unable to control things, that disorients us. So, with respect to living in the world, there are always going to be things which are not in our control. and that is going to cause us some amount of anxiety the word anxiety or worry has a negative connotation to it we may if you want to use a positive word we could use the word concern there are many issues which concern us and we don't have control over them and no matter how much we expand our capacity to control we will never be able to have control over everything so in that sense the uncertainty because of not having things in our control or not having control over everything or our things being there which are not in our control that is going to be a fact of life always to a large extent the modernization of the world has led to a dramatic cosmetic effect cosmetic effect means things look very good even if there is a terrible accident within 10 minutes everything is cleaned up and it appears as nothing went wrong everything appears very smooth and this applies even to not just external situations but also our internal emotions means we tr- do or try to do a very good cover up job for our emotions so so much so that in today's world consider being anxious being worried 
while it is natural it is considered if you have any negative feelings if you feel lonely if you feel depressed if you feel unhappy it's almost as if being unhappy is a defect in someone why do you like this actually the nature of the world is that it is going to sometimes give us troublesome situations and that is going to cause us negative emotions so just as we can't control the weather out there it's going to become cold it's going to become cold and some people have say bodies which become excessively cold which respond excessively to cold now if we tell don't get worried in some ways it is like telling someone don't feel cold <laughs> what do you mean don't feel cold i'm feeling cold said <laughs> it that cold is simply a biological reaction to the stimuli in some people it may be more in some people it may be less but it is simply there in everyone to degree different degrees similarly anxiety which results because of life's uncertainty it's a fact of life it's going to be there in everyone and when we talk about a situation there's something in our control something's out of our control so to the extent we focus on things out of our control to the extent we are going to have anxiety and when we are unable to control either external situations or internal emotions because we have this conception that i am meant to be the controller we just can't deal with it there is a field of science and technology which is called transhumanism transhumanism says that humanity is afflicted by many sufferings and they say what are the sufferings old age disease death they don't consider birth a suffering uh, of course in some ways they consider some births to be unwanted and they want to have more efficient ways of doing abortion but in many ways the suffering that they identify are similar to what the bhagavad gita says janma mrityu jara vyadhi dukkha dosha anudarshi but after identifying this the aim of this field of science and technology is that through the advancement of technology we will remove these sufferings we will remove disease we will remove old age and we will remove death now of course we human beings have been given some capacity to control and if somebody is sick we develop we take medicines we develop medicines that's natural if somebody is old if you can help them to become more energized that's fine the bhagavatam also says the body is the tool for practicing dharma so the body is like the tree and uh, dharma or the fruit of dharma mukti or prema is the fruit so if the tree is cut the fruit will not come similarly the body is destroyed then the we cannot attain liberation we have to use the body as a tool to get the fruit of liberation that's why the bhagavatam says it's our duty to protect our body and developing methods to protect the body is natural in the tradition uh, there was ayurveda which also focused on the same purpose so it, this is all this is not to deny that we human beings have some capacity to control and we are meant to use that capacity but the idea that we can control everything that is a illusion so with respect to as i said anxiety anxiety itself is not a disorder but our reaction to anxiety can make it a disorder that means anxiety is just a response to uncertainty and that comes it is natural but how we respond to it that can make it into a disorder so i will talk about three examples to illustrate this point normally in the animal world whenever there is any danger there are two responses fight or flight we are in the human body most of us our souls have come from some lower species to the human body of course some of you may have come from higher planets also but at least i can see from my conditioning i have come from from very low species so because of the soul having come from the lower species there is the uh, in the mind the momentum of responding in the same way the animals respond so when we face dangers we try to respond with these two ways fight or flight and sometimes both these responses
can end up aggravating the situation. So if we consider uh, the philosophical perspective, the Bhagavad Gita says there are three modes of material nature. And these modes, they impel us to responses in particular ways. So in general, we can say that if there are some things in our control, some things not in our control. So the, in the mode of passion, we overestimate our capacity to control. I can fix it. Whatever is the problem, I can fix it. So if there is a relationship issue, if that person has the problem and I know how to deal with that person. I'll fix them up. And in the mode of ignorance, we underestimate our capacity to control. We feel if some, some, there is a relationship issue, is there, oh, you know, this is what happens with me every time. Oh, life is rotten. People are so selfish. Destiny is against me. And we go into self-pity. We have what is called a pity party. <laughs> so in the mode of ignorance, we feel as if nothing is in our control. So we could say broadly speaking that uh, the fight response is the response on the mode of passion where we are overestimating our capacity to control, I, mean, I can deal with this issue. And the flight response is coming from the mode of ignorance. Oh, I can't do anything. I just have to get out of here. Uh, so let's consider some examples. So suppose somebody has fallen in a quicksand. Now, when we, if we fall in a quicksand, and then we feel ourselves sinking inside, sinking inside. It's scary. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be suffocated. I'll die. And the natural response there is to struggle. Struggle to try to come out. But actually the best way, the safest thing that we can do if we are caught in the sand is just stay still. The more we try to move and pull ourselves out, the more the suction from below, that creates suction from below and pulls us down. Just stay still. Now, staying still may not get us out, but at, we, at least it will not take us in further. So stay still and call out to someone. Seek help in some other way. So there, when we are in the quicksand, oh, the quicksand is sucking me in, I have to fight it out. But of course, there can be quicksand also of different kinds. But generally, the more we endeavor, the more we get bound. So in some situations, the more we try to fight the situation, actually the situation becomes worse. So I'll come to that kind of situations a little later. But this is one example where uh, sometimes some situations are difficult. There is some anxiety, there is some worry, and I just have to live with it. So if uh, I have given my exam and I don't, the results are very important for me. But I don't know what the results are going to be. Now, if during that period I keep worrying, worry, hey, what is the result going to be? What is the result going to be? What is the result going to be? Now, now at that stage, I've already given the exam. It's over. There's nothing in my control. You keep trying to fight it. It's not going to help. There is anxiety. But so avoiding the fight response means in some situations, you have to learn to live with the uncertainty. That uncertainty is not going to be infinite. But if at that time, you know, in order to forget that, uh, some people just because they are already given the exam, but the anxiety is so much that they get into activities, uh, they may just dive into sports, dive into entertainment, dive into, if they have some other habits, they may just start drinking, start, so smoking or start taking drugs. So anxiety is, a, is in that situation just a fact of life. But to the extent we try to get rid of it, to that extent, it makes our life worse. Most often, uh, when people uh, watch entertainment, now, entertainment, it's, it has always been a, a feature of human society. But the compulsiveness with which people go for entertainment now, it is unprecedented. Millions and millions of dollars people spend on, we may not say, I, I don't spend millions of dollars, but people like us, they keep spending. And that's how those who are entertainers, they get 
obscene amounts of money. So in India, there was a female boxer from Northeast and she won some medals. And then Bollywood made a movie out of her life. Now the actress who depicted her, just by depicting that movie, she made more money than what that boxer had made throughout her life. <laughs> so at one level, boxing itself is entertainment. People are watching sports for entertainment. But even that real life boxing is not as entertaining. So when you depict it in the movie, the entertainment level becomes more and you get paid more for that. So when we are ready to pay so much, what does it indicate? It indicates that we feel the need for it so much. And most often when people get into entertainment, it's not because what they're watching is so entertaining or so enjoyable. It is because life is so boring. So because we are unable to live with negative feelings, of any kind, whether it is worry or boredom or loneliness or annoyance, we just try to escape from that by going into entertainment. And that's why it becomes obsessive for some people. Now, of course, we can say entertainment is relatively inoffensive, but then when they get hooked to the entertainment, when it is not there, it becomes unbearable. So uh, there was a survey done in um, America itself. You know, what are people's worst nightmares? So especially people who are in the youth group, you know, teenagers, their worst nightmare was being without the internet. <laughs> One of their worst nightmares, you know, out, out the top is being without the internet. What will I do? So it's just become, it's, internet can be very useful for communicating and getting things done. But there's a dependence that happens, which is quite damaging. Similarly, when people uh, smoke or drink, it is largely not that the drink is so attractive. It is rather that they're not able to process the negative emotions that come because of life's negativities and that becomes an escape way from that. So when that happens, then they may start drinking just to escape from this negative, but then the drinking itself becomes a negative afterwards. That, attach, that makes them attached to it, addicted to it. Even. So the point I'm making is sometimes when negativities come in our life, sometimes anxieties come in our life, Trying to fight that off actually worsens our situation. Like a person in the quicksand. Okay, I'm in the quicksand. Let me wait. Let me wait. Let me call out to someone. Someone will come and pull me out. If I try to struggle and pull myself out, I'm only going to get sucked more. So like that, some situations, anxieties are there and they will be there for some time. We just have to live with it. So, Tams Titiksha Swabharata. This is tolerated. So tolerance means don't have this fight response. Don't try to fight it off. We can't, it's interesting, Krishna actually equates Matras Parshasukaushnaya Shita Ushna Sukha Dukkha Daha. So he's saying Shita and Ushna is similar to Sukha and Dukkha. That means just as when externally it is hot or cold, we can't do much about it. It is hot or cold. Similarly, sometimes positive feelings, sometimes negative feelings will come upon us. Tolerate it. I'll talk a little bit about how we can tolerate it. But the principle here is that the fight response may often makes us do things which degrade the quality of our life. Because we can't directly deal with the anxiety. So we try to do other things to, to deny the anxiety, to bury the anxiety. And then that leads to uh, us getting into unwanted habits which waste our time, which degrade the quality of our life. The other response could be the, the in the mode of ignorance is flight response. Suppose we are gone on a mountain trek and then we, we go around a cliff and then suddenly you see a big grizzly bear over there. And that bear is right looking at us. Now everything within us will tell it, turn and run. This bear will eat me. But those who are Trekkers, seasoned trekker, they say that trying to run away from that beer is often the worst thing to do. Because as soon as you start running away from that beer, that triggers the excitement of chasing in the beer. And the beer will start chasing after us. And if it is going to chase, it is going to outrun us. So, what, what forest trekkers recommend is that if you see a beer, 
just stay calm don't turn your back to the deer just keep looking at it and keeps gently taking steps backward so if the deer feels that we are going to attack it it will attack us the deer feels we are going to run away from it then also it will get excited i'll chase you just calmly move back now no. everything will is say you can't be calm get out of here <laughs> but at that time just stick um, stick gentle steps move back move back move back move back and the bear now of course with respect to animals they are unpredictable so no strategy is sure to work <laughs> but <laughs> but in general it is that if we don't do any major reaction the bear stays where it is and we can be safe so similarly for us when some problems come i just want to i want to get out of here the flight response comes in i don't want this so one is the first thing i said is fight means we try to get rid of the situation second is flight means we try to get out of the situation the two things there is a situation which is causing anxiety i try to get rid of the situation or i try to get out of the situation but sometimes in trying to get out of the situation we make things worse because if we just get out eventually uh, people who had expected us to do something they feel that like, we can't count on you you just uh, flee when uh, going get stuff or that itself becomes like a habit on us this is what i'm going to do and then we can't face situations and many times when the problems are there initially they appear to be very difficult but if we stay and we try to deal with them we are we find okay this is not unlivable i can manage with this so the flight response is trying to is just get out of here that is also anxiety driven so what i said earlier anxiety itself is not a disorder but our response to anxiety can make it a disorder right now in some people when they have anxiety at that time they just uh, they may start trembling they may start feeling very fearful and then certain biological reactions may happen and then at that time if they go to doctor doctor says okay take this antidepressant take this medication take this tranquilizer now in some cases when there is extreme biological reactions medication may be required so the the bhagavad gita explains that the mind is at the interface between the body and the soul so because the mind is at the interface between the body and the soul so the mind can be affected in both ways actually the what goes on in the mind it can come from three sources it can come from the physical level what are the perceptions that we are experiencing it can come even at the mental level itself from the recollections of the reflection that are going on at the subtle level or it can come from the spiritual level based on what is the intention of the person so <clears throat> in some uh, in some uh, some yoga sutra commentaries they talk about three levels of the mind there is the outer mind the middle mind and the inner mind so the outer mind is what is is connection with the body the middle mind is the subtle level of reality the inner mind is what connects with the soul so what this means is that if we see the state of the mind affects the state of the body if we are worried immediately our breathing may become fast maybe our body will start trembling and conversely the state of the body can also affect the state of the mind so if i am feeling worried just take deep breaths so breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out is focus the attention on the breath and that calms down why because i said the mind is connected with the body also so at the physical level if certain adjustment is done that can help the mind to calm down so some adjustment can be done through breathing that the mind is different from the brain but the mind is connected with the brain also broadly speaking if you say there's it's like a software so the bo- the body is like the hardware the mind is like the software the soul is the user the brain is like the cpu in the hardware so in some ways the state of the brain and the state of the mind are very closely related 
so if some people they have too much anxiety then they may find that taking some medicines helps to calm them because the physical and the mental are not unrelated they are related however <clears throat> the mental is its own level of existence also so when there are human problems so anxiety is a human problem loss say we lose a loved one because of whatever that's a human problem that's a problem of being a human being a human being means it makes us vulnerable to loss to loneliness to anxiety to fear uh, so these are just human problems now i talked earlier about transhumanism what it tries to do is it tries to find technological solutions to human problems now some human problems can be dealt with by technology but the, we are not machines and our entire being cannot be dealt with by technology so what is happening here is we try to find chemical solutions to human problems so anxiety is a human problem loss is a human problem when i try to find a chemical solution that means what i am trying to do is that we are trying to adjust the chemicals in the brain by which okay you don't feel this negative it can help to some extent but it is a superficial solution why because the mind is much more than the then the manifestation of the mind that happens at the level of the brain that means says when i get anxious certain chemicals come up uh when i feel lonely certain things happen in the brain so if i try to find out okay what are those changes happening in the brain and how can i reverse them and i'll not feel anxious that's fine but anxiety is not just that the anxiety is not caused by those uh, chemicals becoming more in the brain rather those chemicals becoming more is the result of the anxiety so and that anxiety is a result of the way i am responding to reality so there is the reality which is causing me worry but that is something which is always going to come in my life sooner or later so we need to uh, if we depend on chemicals alone that becomes a dependence and that can have a lot of side effects at the physical level as well as at the behavioral level so trying to use chemical now if you see just 30 40 50, around 1960s was the first time a medicine like a tranquilizer was discovered there was nothing like that before is that people didn't have anxiety before that always there was anxiety but now tra uh, tranquilizers antidepressants they are the most sold medicine across the counter and some of the pharma companies which manufacture this their budget is more than the budget of several european countries so they just make so much money through this so this is unfortunately become a big business now this is not to say that in some cases medicine may be required if there is some severe chemical imbalance in the brain if there is some structural damage to the brain at that time some medication may be required so the an example to illustrate it is suppose we are driving by a car and the car tire suddenly ruptures this is a puncture now i need to change the tire so that the car can function now, but to change the tire i need to lift the tire up i need to lift the whole car up a little bit so that i can remove the tire and then i can put a better tire so similarly in some cases uh, when we are going through life something happens and we just get punctured get totally depressed so when that happens the if the car tire is punctured it has to be replaced so similarly when we are habituated to negative thinking uh, the negative thinking itself has to be changed but sometimes as like lifting the car up so that the tire can be changed so similarly in some cases medication can act like a jack which lifts up the tire so when a person is too depressed they can't even think about changing their thinking his mind is just going on and on and on and this problem that problem this wrong that wrong just helpless to some extent when we go into tamoguna in the mode of ignorance just become helpless so at that time it may be required 
but the purpose of the tire of the car is not to keep the uh, keep it on the jack the purpose of the car is to move and for moving what we need is not to have a jack below the car but we have to have change the tire so similarly in extreme situations some people may need medications but the the solution is not just the medication the solution is the changing the thinking changing the thinking means changing the way we respond to life's negativities changing the way we respond to life's uncertainties so there's no need to campaign against such medicines but there's no need to uh, also think that these medicines alone are the solution so what happens in today's world it is i said anxiety as it it can be a disorder when we get too depressed and we get too negative and we just not able to function at all but it is very easy to classify anxiety as a disorder and everybody is afflicted and then the pharma companies make big money and we feel good but then after that when we feel bad we need more medicines so there are some diseases which we take and we get cured and they don't need the medicine but anxiety if you start taking medicines then it's lifelong we we'll have to keep taking medicines so it becomes a dependence so we need to as i talked about this the mind which interacts with the body the mind itself and the mind with, part of the mind that interacts with the soul because the outer mind the middle mind and the inner mind so the outer mind it can be dealt with in various ways and there have been several studies which have found that the same effect that comes by tranquilizers that can be got to some degrees by just breathing this pranayam deep breathing it calms the mind down in fact it's not i'll talk about breathing breathing is not just a physical exercise breathing breathing can act at a mental level also in more ways than just uh, the physical aspect of it but the point here is that the in some ways the physical level of reality is most accessible to us and recently i was a program and i asked one devotee asked a question now when we are chanting you know why why does our mind wander so much why are we so attentive to chanting so i said actually we are not chanting you know our tongue is chanting the mind is wandering and we are thinking what to do <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so there can be chanting that is outside in i start from outside and i keep chanting keep chanting and then it comes in i hear it ah this chant. i connect with krishna then i feel connected then there is chanting which comes inside out that is i feel like calling out to krishna krishna i need you i want you i long for you so outside in chanting should lead to inside out chanting we begin from outside we start chanting and gradually as we connect with krishna then we start calling for krishna but sometimes instead of outside in leading to inside out it just is outside outside chanting <laughs> <laughs> so it is physical level the lips are uttering something but there is no mind involved there is no heart involved there is no in consciousness invested in it so the physical so the physical level so now if i tell concentrate on the chanting okay what i can do is start chanting the physical level is what is accessible to us most easily so if you see there is the soul which is spiritual level there is the mind which is the mental level and then there is the body which is at the physical level when the mind goes off most of the time when we get anxiety what exactly happens it is basically the mind and the body they go out of sync so the mind is going off somewhere else and when it goes off somewhere else then it just starts imagining this imagining that imagining that um, our mind usually gives a running commentary on everything <laughs> <laughs> running commentary means that say, if a cricket match is going on then there are commentators who are meant to explain okay you know this player has played like this this is shot like this this means this this means that Now, sometimes it happens if the commentators are not very professional uh, they go off on a tangent and then they just go off in another direction entirely 
and then they are talking you know this happened in this match and that happened in this match and that happened and what is happening in this match they don't report only <laughs> <laughs> so like that <laughs> the mind is it's the commentator of whatever is happening so uh, now while commenting on what it is happening it's commenting can be so captivating it did not be right it did not be true but it can be so captivating that we just get caught in the commentary and forget the reality and uh, taking this further normally in the cricket match there are spectators and there are players and the commentary is heard by the spectators but suppose the commentary is heard by the players also <laughs> 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 the commentator is a god of all time you know oh, this happened in this match and it went like this and like that and like that and the player also forget oh, i'm supposed to play here <laughs> or the commentator starts saying you know oh, in this situation with so few balls remaining and so many runs to be scored no team has won till now it's almost impossible to, it's impossible to win and the player yeah it's impossible to win <laughs> so like that the mind is constantly giving a commentary on things and we tend to be more tuned to the commentary of the mind than the reality and the reality can sometimes be negative no doubt but the mind's commentary can make it much worse i go to office and then my boss gives me a strange look and then the mind starts giving comment oh your boss is going to fire you if he fires you what is going to happen you know you have no job then how will you pay your mortgage you can't pay your mortgage you won't be able to stay in your house you can't stay in your house then you'll be on the streets oh it'll be so cold and you know right now you are trembling because of ac and then <laughs> we think i'll be trembling because of the cold <laughs> so the mind's commentary can just go in any direction and the mind is a creature of habit that means if i do one thing once twice thrice it just starts tending to do that again and again and again so when uh, this mind it becomes habituated to worrying as i said uncertainty is just a fact of life and uncertainty causing anxiety or concern if you want to use a more positive word that's also a fact of life but where our thoughts go after that okay that is not in my control and if that goes wrong it will be big trouble for me. that's true but if i start worrying this goes wrong that goes wrong that goes wrong that goes wrong then it's like the mind is giving a very pessimistic comment and that can make my life completely miserable so in what we need to do is come back to reality so when the mind's commentary is just going off in various directions now if we could we'll talk later about remembering krishna that is rising to spiritual level of reality but generally the spiritual is difficult to access for us so the physical is relatively more accessible as one devotee he he had a lot of anxiety disorder problem anxiety problems and he started doing breathing exercises and he was telling me that actually you know breathing works better than hari krishna <laughs> <laughs> he says my anxiety is gone just started breathing so i'll talk about that it's not that breathing works better than hari krishna but rather because we are at the physical level of consciousness so at the physical level the relief can appear much more quickly basically uh what is when we are getting worried and we break the train of worry so we if you have to stop worrying what do we need to do we need to break the train train of thoughts which is going in the you could say the station of worry so we got to break that train we don't want to get on to that train we have to get out so now at the level of the mind there is running commentary is going on chanting hare krishna actually is meant to take us to the spiritual level and if you can get to the spiritual level then that is the supreme relief from anxiety but because the spiritual level sometimes appears not easily accessible for us so when we are chanting actually we go neither to the physical level 
not not the neither to the spiritual level not to the physical level so the chanting that is meant to control the mind often the chanting becomes a time when we surrender to the mind because what i said earlier what happens that the tongue is chanting the mind is wandering and the soul is wondering what to do <laughs> so now for the soul the mind is commenting and appears so attractive that the soul goes along with the mind so if our consciousness is going along with the mind wherever it is going then actually we are not chanting the tongue is chanting but we are not involving our consciousness in chanting so we could be relieved by chanting but sometimes it's difficult to get our consciousness involved in chanting so so we could say chanting is like a elevator for our consciousness to take us from the physical level through the mental level to the spiritual level so the elevator is going up and say it's freezing cold at the ground level and i go up it's it's warm now the elevator is going up but i don't go up only i just stay outside the elevator and i power the elevator elevator goes up comes down goes up comes down goes up comes down <laughs> then what happens in that case is that i don't get any relief so when we don't get we don't invest our consciousness in chanting then it appears that chanting is not working then why does uh, many uh, why does breathing seem to work as explained this is what happens when breathing it's not just breathing what what when people try to do breathing exercise they also told that okay concentrate on your breathing take the breath in breathe out you know breathe in they see that your stomach is going inside chest is going contracting chest is expanding so what happens when we try to do this consciously the consciousness comes from the mental level to the physical level and just getting the consciousness from the mental level to the physical level breaks the worry train of the mind so that's why when we are chanting we are not breaking the worry train although we could break it in the most effective way but when somebody is breathing they are able to break it better so it's not the chanting uh, doesn't work and breathing works but at that particular point we have to see what is going to break the train of thoughts of the mind and in some ways getting to the physical level is easier than getting to the spiritual level for us so even during chanting if we find that the mind is wandering too much we we'll pause take a few deep breaths you need if you're sitting stand up and walk a little bit do some get the consciousness back to the physical level and i think oh i'm meant to chant right now okay otherwise you know we are chanting but we are not even aware we are chanting so at least i become aware i'm chanting okay i'm chanting. i mean i'm meant to chant so then at the mind level the consciousness will not wander so the physical level is the way we can access is the level which we can access the most so so now when we are trying to deal with anxiety so the mind is what is causing us anxiety so we can deal with it at the physical level get the consciousness out of the mind i say get out of your head don't be too much into your head get out do something practical so like that we get out of our head we get out of our thoughts to the physical level that itself can help to deal with the anxiety but again that is not a permanent solution we have to so all these are ways in which when the tire is deflated we raise it up but beyond that we need to change the way we think change the way we think means that we have to change the idea that we have to be in control of everything negative emotions are never pleasant but they are a fact of life and we need to accept it sometimes i may feel bored sometimes i may feel lonely sometimes i may feel depressed sometimes i may feel hopeless sometimes these are all emotions which just come krishna in the bhagavad gita in the 14th chapter says that become an observer of your emotions prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava nadveshti sampravrittani na nivrittani kaankshati udasi na vadasinam gunayo na vichalyate So in 14.22.23 says that by the modes different emotions will rise within the consciousness. So just observe them. Udasi na vadasi na. Be like a detached observer. Okay, this emotion is coming. It will stay for some time. It will go. It will come. It will go. Now suppose we go for a program or a meeting, and there is someone whom we don't like. Now if that person is there, what do I do? I think I don't want to even look at the face of this person. Then I can't be there at the meeting. I have to be there at the meeting. 
But just because that person is there doesn't mean I leave the meeting. Nor does it mean that if I, if I, if I don't get along with that person, if I have some issues, and that is not the time to deal with the issue. It's not that I had to go and confront that person at that time. I just focus on doing what I, I meant to do. That presence is there and I'll be aware of it, but I don't have to avoid it, nor do I have to focus on it. So Krishna says, Rag Dvesha Vimukta Isto. Avoid attachment and avoid aversion. This is not just to external sense objects. It can also be to internal emotions that arise within us. Don't be too attached to something. Don't be too averse to something. Okay, that emotion is there. It's present within us, but we don't have to focus on it. Now, what does it mean uh, that uh, emotion is there? See, our consciousness is capable of being aware of many things. So right now, some of you may be feeling that this place is too cold. Some of you may be feeling this is too warm. Now, if you're feeling this way, this is something which is there in the awareness. Now, we can choose whether I'm going to focus on this. Oh, it's so cold. It's so cold. What can I do? What can I do? I can't do it. Maybe I need to get a sweater or maybe I need to leave right now. Uh, we can just get too caught in that thought. Okay, it's cold. Maybe it's just a bit, uh, maybe it's not a long class. We'll be here for some time. Next time when I come for the programs, I'll come to bed. I just put the thought behind. So what happens is, we as human beings, we can't always control what comes in our consciousness. But we can control what is the focus of our consciousness. So many things will pop up in our consciousness. But we are capable of choosing what to focus on. Suppose we are, you know, we are having an important phone call with someone. And there's somebody talking in the background. Now we may request them to stay silent. But if, if it's just this noise that is there, it can't be removed. So if we're traveling in a car or a train and there's noise, then what do we do? We try to put it in the background by focusing. We focus, why is the sound there? We can't change that sound. So although that sound will be there, but we can choose what to focus on. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about First, in 14.2023, he's talking about the Sakshi Bhav. Sakshi Bhav means become an observer of your consciousness. And in general, uh, mindfulness, which has become very popular and very effective in today's world, that is all about becoming an observer of your consciousness. Observe. So don't get involved, just observe. Now, Krishna talks about being an observer, but he talks about something more. He says in 14.26, the way to go beyond the influence of the modes is by bhakti. Maam cha yoga bicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samati tyaitan brahma bhoyaya kalpate. It's by the practice of bhakti, one can go beyond the influence of the modes. So there is sakshi bhav and there is seva bhav. Seva bhav is a service attitude. If I situate myself in the understanding that I am a servant of Krishna and whatever situation comes in my life, I am meant to serve Krishna. So sometimes for our service, we may have to go to a place which is very cold. It's not very pleasant, but we deal with it. We live with it and we continue our service. Similarly, sometimes some services may be such that they put us in situations which cause a lot of, lot of anxiety. So we don't focus on the anxiety, we focus on the service. Okay, I'm here to serve Krishna. And let me think how best I can serve Krishna. We don't deny the feel, the fact that I'm worried, but we don't magnify it either. We accept it. As yes, this service causes me anxiety. Now later on, I may decide whether this is a service which is important for me to do, whether somebody else can do it better, whether I can do some service better. There are situations where we can think about these things. But when we have to do a particular thing and the uh, negative emotion is unavoidable over there, just accept its presence. Accept its presence means that we don't let it become the focus of our consciousness. Our focus is on how can I serve Krishna? Now sometimes if we, uh, if we don't understand bhakti philosophy properly, then the mind can actually aggravate our situation. So I feel worried. And the first the mind makes me worried, you know, I, you know, this can go wrong, that can go wrong, that can go wrong. I am spending so much time in your bhakti. 
you know, what if you don't do well in your studies? What if you don't do well in job? Things will go wrong. The mind makes us worried. And then after that, see, you call yourself a devotee, but you don't have any faith in Krishna. You're having so much worry. What kind of devotee are you? So, first I get worried, and then I become worried about being worried. <laughs> So in that way, the mind just takes us on a wild ride at the mental level. So, so is it that as devotees, we have faith in Krishna, we should not have worry? No, worry is simply a reaction to uncertainty. And that is going to be there for everyone. But what do we do about it? How do we respond to it? So if I, if I respond, yes, I am having this worry. That means I have a particular, we all have a particular kind of body. We have a particular kind of mind. So, and we have to serve with the kind of body and the kind of mind that we have. So rather than resenting or denying, or this is, if I feel cold, I feel cold. So then I try to wear some warm clothes and do my service. Similarly, if I feel worried, I feel worried. And uh, feeling worried is not necessarily a defect in our character or a defect in our devotion. It's just a part of being human. Being human means there will be worry. But... What is in our power is what do we how do we respond to the worry? So if we focus on Krishna in the mode of goodness, I earlier said that in, uh, in passion we overestimate, we fight. I can control, I can fix everything. In ignorance, we, f we fly, we fly, I can't fix anything. But in goodness, we are able to pursue properly. Then this, this is in my control, this is not in my control. And then we can respond more maturely. So if we focus on trying to serve Krishna, okay, in this situation, this is what has happened. This is the this, this is the emotion that I am having. How best can I serve Krishna? If I focus on that, then I can move forward steadily. So I'll conclude with one example. Uh, that is in 2.70, Krishna says that Apurimanam Chala Pratishtam Samudrama Pravishanti Advad Tadvat Kamayam Pravishanti Sarve. He says that just as rivers flow into the ocean, similarly, various stimuli and the emotions associated with the stimuli, they will flow into our consciousness. But, he says the ocean is not disturbed. Similarly, a self-realized person or a spiritually advanced purpose, person is not disturbed. Now, I will talk about three aspects of this metaphor. First is one word Krishna uses, na kama kami. It's a very interesting word. Kama kami. That means desirer of desire. So what does it mean, desirer of desire? Normally we think of desire as something which flows out of our consciousness. You know, oh, I desire to eat this, I desire to watch this, I desire to buy this. But here Krishna is comparing, comparing desires to rivers flowing into the ocean. That means desire is something flowing into our consciousness. So, desires, emotions are not exactly the same, but for our purpose of analysis, it's similar. And so, the point is, when Krishna says, na kama kami, what he means is that the stimuli will flow into our consciousness. And say, if I'm sitting here and I start feeling cold, that stimuli is coming into my consciousness. But kama kami means I respond to the stimuli and get carried away by it. Oh, I'm feeling cold, what should I do? But nakama kami means the desire comes in, but we don't respond by desiring that object. It comes in, but we neglect it. We focus on something else. And so similarly, worry inducing situations may be there outside and they may send in the stimuli which causes us worry. But how do I respond? We don't focus on it. Now, when I try to I said, I shouldn't feel worried. That's like saying the river should not flow into the ocean. That will require a huge effort. How do you get a river to stop flowing into the ocean? The stimuli in this world are so uncertain, they're just going to come in. We can't stop it. But imagine if instead of an ocean, there's a puddle over there and a river flows into the puddle. Everything will be disrupted over there. The puddle will overflow, everything will be chaos around it. So, but if there is an ocean, that much effect will not be there. 
So our consciousness, if it is like a puddle, if I'm internally empty, I'm internally insecure, I'm internally living a bankrupt life, then when some negativity comes up, it just makes me collapse. I just get completely lost. But if I'm internally like an ocean, what does that mean? Internally, I am fixed in Krishna. Krishna is like an oceanic reality. Sabha Sukha Sagar, Sabha Guna Agar. Krishna is like an ocean of happiness, an ocean of peace, so an ocean of security. So to the extent we invoke Krishna's presence in our consciousness, to that extent our consciousness becomes like an ocean. And when the consciousness becomes like an ocean, then the stimuli coming from outside, they don't disrupt us so much. So oh, the seva bhav is what enables us to make our consciousness into an ocean. If we do not have the service attitude, if we have this is a demanding attitude, why is this happening? Why is that not happening? Why is that not happening? Then our consciousness gets caught in that, that particular situation. Now what determines, the, we could say the size of our consciousness, whether it's like a puddle or it's like an ocean. Basically, that is determined by what is the primary content of our consciousness. Now, our consciousness can expand or contract based on what its content it is. Now, there are many things in our consciousness, but there are some things which are like a primary content. If the primary content of my consciousness is money, then if I have a lot of money, I feel a lot of security. If I have very little money, then I feel everything is going wrong. Now money is important. It has to be arranged for. But if that is the primary content of my consciousness, that will be a problem. So if we can make Krishna the primary content of our consciousness, our consciousness will also have to be perceiving other things. There will be other things also in our consciousness, no doubt. But if by the process of sadhana bhakti, we make Krishna the primary content, then, then our consciousness will have a foundation of security, a foundation of strength. Because whatever else is there in our consciousness, those things keep changing. If my consciousness is primarily based on, say, some relationship, and something starts going wrong in that relationship, I feel my whole life is collapsing. So now that all our relationships, different relationships have different levels of importance. Some are very important and we have to deal with them. But our primary content of our consciousness has to be Krishna. And the process of sadhana bhakti is meant to do that. So by sadhana bhakti, our consciousness rises to the spiritual level. And when it rises to the spiritual level, it finds shelter in Krishna. And the more we are sheltered in Krishna, the less we will be affected by the rivers flowing in. Less we will be affected by the anxiety causing stimuli. And we have to find out how we can make Krishna the primary content of our consciousness. So for some of us, it may be through Kirtan. Whenever I, I feel agitated, let me hear some Kirtan. Let me invoke Krishna's presence through Kirtan. For some of us, it may be through Riti worship. Let me worship. It. Let me do this. Let me do that. Some of us, it may be philosophy. I just hear classes, I can feel connection with Krishna. And then that makes my consciousness into like an ocean. So when, through the routine course of our life, because we have to do so many other things, the interaction with those things is going to drain our consciousness. And so we could say our consciousness keeps, its size keeps changing. So when we associate with devotees, we do nice sadhana bhakti chant, nice hearing, go to the temple, then our consciousness become like a ocean. But during the whole week we are away from devotees, the ocean is slowly becoming like a puddle, 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 puddle. And then again come in the association of devotees. We again hear about Krishna, we again chant. Then our consciousness expands. But if we keep doing this regularly, <coughs> Krishna will become more and more of a constant presence in our consciousness. And our consciousness will expand. And when that happens, then our anxiety level will go down because we will have security in Krishna and we will have the steadiness of our connection with Krishna. When both of these are there, then the 
and uncertainties of the world will be there but we will be able to deal with those anxieties in a more mature way we won't get carried away by the mind's horror movie but we'll focus on the reality and with the purpose of serving krishna respond to that reality in an appropriate way so i'll summarize i spoke today about how when we face anxiety how do we respond to it is anxiety a disorder so i talk first about the historical perspective through science and technology advancement there is the premise that we'll be able to control more and more things and anything that is not in control is seen as a dysfunctionality or disorder so we have been able to control through technology external situations to some extent but when we expect that internal emotions also we'll be able to control then that is a unrealistic expectation because we all no matter how much we expand our control there will always be things out of our control and they are going to cause anxiety so anxiety is a human problem just being human means being in situations which will cause us anxiety and the way to deal with it is by um, the, the the transhumanism says that by technology you can deal with everything so if we take medication for this oh i feel anxious just take a medication and get it ready that makes us dependent on it more and more i talk about how the mind could be analyzed in three parts the mind is like the interface between the soul and the body so there is a part of the mind which connects with the soul that is inner mind the part of the soul, mind which connects with the body that is outer mind and the central mind which is the subtle level so middle mind so now uh the changing of the things at the physical level can help us to calm the mind also a like breathing a breathing accelerates when we are worried we decelerate the breathing or we will become calmer so similarly some people may try to physically change the chemicals in the brain by taking some medicine by which they try to decelerate the anxiety of the brain that works but that is temporary that makes us addicted so when we we as souls have come from the animal species to the human species so we are the animal fight or flight response in the three modes of material nature in mode of passion we overestimate our capacity to control as we fight i can do i can settle everything and in the mode of ignorance we underestimate our capacity and we try to fly from it and both are unhealthy for the fight uh, response i talk about if you are caught in the quicksand fighting to get out will only cause us to sink it. so sometimes some situations we just can't do anything about it i have given my exam what the result is going to be i can't do anything just learn to live with the anxiety and for that we need to have some higher focus and the flight response is like i scared teddy bear i want to run away then when i run away it will chase after me so sometimes the we, we don't want to think about some situation and the more we try to not think about a situation that comes more and more in our mind just dominates us so instead of that just calmly walk away from there that means we have some higher purpose and we focus on that higher purpose so some in some case extreme cases when a person is very depressed some medication may be required that's like if a car tire is punctured you need a jack to lift it up so that you can change the tire but the jack is not going to help the tire car to move it's a changing of the tire that is going to help it to move so similarly and people have extreme depression say it's a kind of serious chemical imbalance or structural damage then some medication may be temporarily helpful but it will change the pattern of thinking changing a pattern of thinking means learning to not focus too much on what is not in our control we focus on what is in our control and i talked about why we practice the the mind is so sometimes it may appear say like breathing works more than chanting it's why does that happen appear like that because the mind is giving a running commentary on everything that is happening so the soul is a spiritual level and the mind in its commentary sometimes gets completely disconnected from reality and when we are chanting the tongue is chanting the mind is wandering and the soul frequently goes off with the mind and then we don't get any relief it's like the elevator is taking us to a warmer play warmer level but we are not getting into the elevator so to access the spiritual level can sometimes seem difficult to access the physical level seems easier so breathing deeply and trying to become aware of the breathing also helps in cutting off or in breaking the train of thoughts in the mind which is causing us worry and that's how it appears to give us relief but we the but to get relief from worry just just breaking the train of thoughts is not enough we need to change the way we think and that means 
changing the core content of our consciousness. So Bhakti makes Krishna the core content of our consciousness. And because Krishna is the supreme unchanging reality, when he is the core content, there is security, there is safety, there is strength over there. The rivers will flow into the oh, ocean, but they will not disturb. So if our consciousness is like an ocean, then anxiety inducing stimuli will flow in, but they won't disrupt us. They won't disturb us that much. And the process of sadhana bhakti, and specifically within sadhana bhakti, the activities that invoke Krishna's presence the most in our consciousness, if we do them regularly, then our consciousness will become like an ocean. And when the consciousness is like an ocean, then the life's uncertainties will not cause us so much anxiety. We will respond to them with greater maturity. And for us, the process of bhakti yoga is ultimately about First, we use Sakshi Bhav to distance ourselves from the emotion. They are there, but I don't identify with them. But then we want Seva Bhav. I want to focus on serving Krishna. And that Seva Bhav will invoke Krishna's presence in our consciousness. And that's how we'll be able to go beyond anxiety. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So are there any questions or comments? Just repeat the last few sentences how to connect with Krishna a little more. Um, okay, yeah. Thing. So, how to connect with Krishna? Uh, basically, each of us is an individual, as a soul, we are individual, and we have a particular kind of body and mind also. So, based on the kind of body mind we have, our consciousness tends to flow in a particular direction. So if somebody is musically inclined, then their consciousness flows in the direction of music very easily. Now for philosophy, they can make their consciousness go there, but they have to push it, push it. But music, it naturally flows. If somebody else is more intellectual, their consciousness naturally flows towards philosophy. Oh, analysis, this is very good. But if you tell them to come and do some, maybe do some deity worship, oh, okay, I'll do it. But you know, they, have, they have to push themselves to do it. So all of us are individuals. Yeah. So we have to look at which are the channels in our consciousness, where our consciousness flows naturally. And then we can see where uh, that channel, how, or how that channel can take us towards Krishna. So, that way, when that channel is used to connect us with Krishna, then the connection with Krishna becomes relatively easier. And once there is some connection with Krishna, through that activity, then we can work at other activities also to connect with Krishna. Because the connection with Krishna gives us some strength, some taste, some satisfaction. And then we can push ourselves and connect in other ways also. So basically, uh, the finding the usual or default channels of our consciousness and seeing in which of those channels we can bring Krishna and then letting our consciousness go along those channels. That's the way we can invoke Krishna's presence. That's your question? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi Krishna, thank you for the class. Uh, so the title of the class, could you repeat? Is anxiety a disorder? And the answer was anxiety is not a disorder, but our response to anxiety can make it a disorder. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the, the title that I had heard was about turning anxiety into, into intensity. intensity. And I was wondering about okay. that part. Okay, so I basically addressed that in the sense that I said we become purposeful. The intensity is in two parts. The intensity is in terms of whether we become the observers very carefully. We intensely observe our consciousness, Sakshi Bhav and Seva Bhav. Both are the ways in which you can develop intensity. So idea is that if I become an observer of my consciousness, alert observer, then when some emotions come up, I can, ide I can identify them and then I can distance myself from them. And if I have an intense service attitude, it's like you're intensely concentrating on something, then even if many other things are happening, we don't focus on them. So like that, within our consciousness, there may be anxiety. <laughs> but if we focus on the service to Krishna, that intensity will enable us to distance ourselves from other stimuli that are present within our consciousness. Okay. Thank you. Yes, bro. Thank you for a very wonderful class. I just have two, two, one comment and one question. Uh, the, so there are two, you know, very classic landmark books that have been written by Robert Whittaker. 
He's an award-winning American journalist, and he's mm -hmm. written a book called uh, The Anatomy of an Epidemic. Mm -hmm. And the second book that he's written is called Mad in America. These two books, you know, highlight the the problem of mental health, the problem of anxiety and depression, the rise of antidepressants, you know, the mm -hmm. the problems of overuse of these things, and and he summarizes, you know, in quite you know elaborate ways these two things. So it's quite an interesting read to read. You know, these things. His name is Robert Whittaker. Mm. The second comment I have, Maharaj, is this. In, in the physical world, in biological sciences, in social sciences, in, in uh, mathematical, statistical sciences, in medical sciences, there is also a very sincere attempt, actually let me put it this way, a very sincere and a humble attempt to understand the nature of reality. And Sometimes they may not be using the same terminology of, or the same processes of, of bhakti, of, of seva, of, uh, you know, because they're not coming from those traditions. But yes, there is a very simple, you know, there is a very honest and a sincere uh, effort in, in all of these endeavors of, of human yeah. mind to relate, to understand the nature of reality. How should we relate? To, to this aspect of of our physical externality, you know, how should we as as practitioners of of a tradition of bhakti relate to this domain of our life? Yeah. So, in the realm of science and technology, also there is a sincere and humble attempt to understand the nature of reality. How should we bhakti practitioners relate with this? Yes. Shri Prabhupada in one conversation on Venice Beach in LA says that you know, we are not against mm, scientists attempt to inquire about reality. We are against their atheism. Now it is not that all scientists are atheists, nor is it that necessarily science leads to atheism. But science currently works with a particular methodology. And that methodology usually doesn't bring God into the picture. That we could call that methodology as uh, naturalism. That means, um, the last year when I was going to um, uh, England, I had gone to Cambridge University to speak over there. So we passed by the tree where Newton is said to have seen the fruit falling or felt the fruit falling, depending on which version of the story we take up. Anyway, so now Newton believed in the existence of God. But when he wanted to know what made this fruit fall, at that time, he was not looking for God as an explanation. He was looking for some material mechanism to explain that. So he, of course, attributed that material mechanism to God, but that's secondary. At that time, he was looking for a material mechanism. And then whatever material mechanism he found out, he called it gravity. And that is within the human scale of observation, it does work at the microscopic level. It may not work, quantum physics is required. But the point which I'm making is, from that point onwards, science, when it starts looking for explanations for natural cause, natural phenomena, it looks for natural causes. And if there is anything beyond nature, science doesn't look for that. There could be that cause, like Newton, his idea was, where does this law of gravity come from? Okay, it's arranged by God. In fact, he considered his scientific discoveries to be equivalent to spiritual insights. He said that, Oh, Father, I think thy thoughts after thee. That means he saw that, okay, this law of gravity is arranged by God. This is the mechanism and I'm seeing it, understanding it. So then here is the material phenomena that we observe. And the material mechanism that we uh, try to discern, which is causing that phenomena. So now science focuses on these two things. Now, what caused the material mechanism itself? That is a question which usually science doesn't discuss. Now, every uh, uh, Paul Davies is a prominent scientist. He's written a book in which he says that the scientists begin with the faith. It's almost a religious-like faith that nature operates according to laws. 
Now, why does nature operate according to laws? Why should nature operate according to laws? There is no, if we just look at the materialistic worldview in science, they treat it like an axiom that nature operates according to laws. In fact, Einstein said that one of the quotes attributed to him is that uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. What does that mean? It means if we consider that everything is a result of unguided natural processes, then our brain is a result of an unguided natural process. The universe out there is a result of an unguided natural process. Now, why should the universe out there have act according to certain laws? Why should the human brain in here be capable of analyzing certain laws? And why should there be a correlation between the two? It's um, I find suppose I find um, suppose I'm I find myself lost. I wake up and I don't understand where I am. And then a, just a leaf flutters in over there. And I find that on that paper something is leaf paper leaf something is written over there. I look at it and it's written in a language, a script that I know. And it's also a message that makes sense to me. It tells me, go there and you will get back home. So now there are three things over there. First of all, that paper fluttering in over there at that time. My being able to uh, know the language in which that what, what is written on that paper. Uh, and thirdly, that paper having a message that I understand. So these three things. Similarly, if you consider nature following certain laws is like that paper fluttering in. Our knowing that language is like the human being, brain being capable of, say, analyzing mathematics. And third is nature functioning according to the laws which we human beings can, we can understand. So this is a remarkable correlation. And why is it like this? This is something which science doesn't have answers for. So science explains nature but the explainability of nature requires an explanation. Why is nature explainable by science? That requires an explanation that science doesn't have. So if we consider there are natural phenomena and there are natural causes. Or by natural I mean material or mechanical. So science looks at these two things. Now why are these material phenomena causes, but mechanisms there which cause this phenomena? That science doesn't look at. But there are scientists who claim that science can answer all questions. That is actually not science, that is scientism. This is imperialism of science extended to all domains of knowledge. Science plus imperialism becomes scientism. So, scientism is what becomes a problem. When you said that there is a there is a sincere attempt to understand the nature of reality, that's definitely true. There are many scientists who are uh, very industriously trying to understand how nature works. But the way scientific scientific methodology works right now is that they look for material mechanisms to explain material phenomena, and that's perfectly fine. But there are many atheists who misappropriate the power and prestige of science to prop up their own ideology. Because science doesn't talk of anything beyond the material mechanisms, for they say there's nothing beyond the material mechanisms. And so that leads to atheism. That means there's nothing beyond matter. So when science becomes misappropriated to foist atheism on people in the name of science, that is when it becomes a serious problem. So there are, of course, some scientists who acknowledge that there will be something non-material also, and we need to explore that. But that is a minority branch, especially because of quantum physics. To some extent, consciousness is being recognized as a fundamental reality. But that is not still mainstream. There is a very, very uh, vehement attempt to try to reduce consciousness down to a material level also. But <clears throat> consciousness has irreducible elements. I've talked about this elaborately in my book on demystifying reincarnation. But suffice it to say that as far as science is looking for material mechanisms for material causes, 
that attempt is appreciated but when it is it is assumed or it is portrayed from there that there is nothing beyond the material mechanisms then it becomes a problem so we respect scientists when they are searching for knowledge in terms of finding the material mechanisms for material causes and through that we learn certain truths that's perfectly fine but it's when they when they make claims which go beyond the domain of knowledge that is where it becomes a problem is answer your question yeah thank you thank you krishna yes electro wow the question and answer was so technical and scientific it went most of it went over my head <laughs> um, but i'll ask a simple version of that question so in your talk you mentioned one scenario where one person i don't know if that was an example or a real scenario that one person said that he thought that chanting hari krishna was not helping that person but the beginning mm, uh, correct yeah. helping. so you broke that down in three parts that mind it's easier to be brought down on the physical level mm. than the spiritual level yeah so um it sounds to me like uh, that person has lost faith in okay. uh, chanting and okay yeah how do you good question actually it's a very important point so is it that if somebody says chant breathing works better than chanting hari krishna does that mean they lost faith in chanting and how do we understand this no the two can serve two different purposes there is pacification of the mind and there is purification of the mind pacification means when something some agitating stimuli is coming in let's make it peaceful make it peaceful so as far as pacification of the mind is concerned breathing can work well even if i say go to a natural place a scenic place look at the mountain look at the sky look at the river i can feel peaceful that's pacification so <clears throat> purification refers to purging the mind of the forces that make it agitated so if as long as there's lust there's anger there is greed there is envy there is selfishness ultimately there is self centered materialism there is going to be agitation so we see that pacification is like a painkiller and purification is like the curative medicine so it is true we don't deny that the painkiller will work faster than the curative medicine but what is the work that it is doing the work is simply removing the pain the work is not curing the disease so if we understand the jurisdiction that's fine and in bhakti also we will say that as i said the idea of getting out of the head and getting into the physical level bhakti is actually very practical activities now we do we, we do cooking we do duty worship we do distribution we do program preaching and all those the practical activities in which we get involved and that engagement also purifies us so the that means the answer has two parts that getting the consciousness at the physical level can pacify it and pacification is valuable it's like if there is a patient who is sick and is in pain then at that end doctor will give curative medicine and will give give uh, pain pain medicine also so similarly if somebody has a lot of anxiety doing some breathing to calm oneself down is perfectly fine but if one start thinking the pain killer is all i need to be cured then one is not understanding what exactly the problem is so, yeah I didn't finish my question. Yeah. Okay. The last part of the question was, how would you give, like, what assurance you will give that chanting will is actually eventually. That's what I'm saying. How will chanting work? So that's purification. That means, yes, anxiety comes in, and I breathe in, breathe out, and feel calm. But again, some anxiety is going to come in. Again, some anxiety is going to come in. As long as my thought pattern is not changing, ultimately, for a devotee. it is anxiety is dealt with by spiritualization of consciousness when i understand that things out of control are ultimately in krishna's control the things that are in my control are also it is a krishna has given me the ability to control so in this way the whole gamut of the situation a devotee connects with krishna so whatever is in my control 
Krishna is giving me that ability and I will use that ability to the best of my capacity. I am not doing this in a mood of independent controllership. I am doing this in a mood of service to Krishna, using the abilities he has given me. And the things that are not in my control, that is in Krishna's control. And Krishna will bring the, will the, bring good out of it eventually. So we have to have the understanding that actually Bhakti is going to purge the mind of the attachment that make us agitated. Of the contamination that make us agitated. So the pain medicine and the curative medicine can go together. If only when the pain medicine is seen as a substitute for the curative medicine, as an alternative, then it becomes a problem. So <clears throat> we all, if our mind gets agitated, we may all find particular ways in which we calm our mind down. Some of us may just chant Hare Krishna, some of us may just recite some verses, some of us may look at the deities, uh, some of us may call a friend and talk with them. We all have our ways of dealing with it. So we accept that the process of Bhakti Yoga is the ultimate process. Now at an immediate level, we if we find something within Bhakti itself which calms us down, that is great. If Kirtans calm me down, that's great. If reciting verses calms me down, that's great. If that doesn't work, that just means that my particular my body might have a conditioning which I need to work, I need to address in a particular way. So sometimes for the same disease, different people may have different kinds of pains and they may need different kinds of pain medicines. So the important thing is not which pain medicine a person is taking. The important thing is whether the person is taking the curative medicine. You can't see a question? Okay. Yes, Mataji. So how much time? Do you have time? Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure which verse uh, this is, but Prabhupada writes in the purport, a person in true Krishna consciousness is a sour patty. Mm -hmm. You can see the crux of a particular situation. Mm -hmm. And many times when we are overwhelmed by anxiety, we cannot see the crux of that particular situation. Mm -hmm. And we find sometimes that um, the solution to whatever problem we are dealing with comes randomly two days later when we are doing something else. That's because our life is so fast paced that most of our time is spent either in performing, doing whatever it takes to rectify the situation, or thinking to come up with a solution. But not enough time is spent in reflecting. Mm. And that reflection comes only when we connect with Krishna. To, to uh, mm. like said, stop that train of thoughts, to say, let that nightmare situation happen. If that is Krishna's will, let that situation happen. I'll figure out a way to serve him even in that. Mm. Let that happen, but let me put that aside. Okay, how am I going to solve this now? Mm. To, to be able to think in that way, that I think is critical to, like you said, get out of your head to come up with a solution. Mm. So we really need to spend that time in reflection and only in that creative source is when true so lasting solution can come. Mm. That's just one comment yeah. to be able to see things as well. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we are facing anxiety and suddenly a random idea comes in which helps us to deal with the problem. Yeah. Actually, I talk about a spiritual level. At the spiritual level, there is a soul and there is a super soul. So, many times the super soul gives us ideas. You can, in, you can call it inspiration, intuition, whatever be the word we use for it. But that can come at any time. So in general, for devotees, when we connect with Krishna, it is not just so that we get security over there, but we also get intelligence from there. And when we are too much caught in the mode of either doing things or thinking what to do, then our focus is not on Krishna. We are not receptive to Krishna. So there is, there is the two aspects in our bhakti. One is uh, taking initiative to do things and second is having re being receptive to Krishna to get ideas of what to do. To, to, to see what he is he that he wants us to do. And both are distinct modes of bhakti. And both are both can be bhakti. At the Bhag in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna when he completes speaking, Arjuna says Karishye Vachanam Tava. I will do your will. Uh, in the Bible, towards the end, Jesus says that, let thy will be done. So here Krishna is saying, I will do your will. They are saying, let thy will be done. So we could say that there are two 
distinct aspects. You know, in that situation, the context was that Jesus knew, had a, some sense that next day he was going to be poisoned. So he said, that, Oh God, let the cup pass. But let thy will be done, not mine. So that means with respect to things that are in our control, we take initiative. But with respect to things that are not in our control, we leave it to Krishna. And then what to do about that? Are we to do anything, not do anything? Or we might have something which we can do, we don't know. So having that receptivity is very important. So in general, in bhakti, the way we focus on is, we do our sadhana bhakti diligently. And that itself is meant to create that receptivity. But sadhana bhakti can just become another activity in our life. And that receptivity doesn't come. So, but if we have that understanding, yes, I have to do my best. But Krishna can just change everything in one moment. So let me be receptive. So there is, uh, especially any person who works in a creative field, uh, they depend a lot on inspiration. So there's a novel laureate author, Somerset Mom. So he was asked, you know, do you write uh, as per a schedule or do you write when you are inspired? He said, I write only I write only when I'm inspired and I make sure that I'm inspired every morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> so what that means is that you know we need to have our discipline that I have to do my part but some days if I'm writing I might just I write and just thoughts just flow and so many ideas come so many things work some days just don't work There's an author who said writing is very easy all you have to do is sit in front of a computer and glare at the screen till drops of blood form on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes no ideas may come. So we have to, uh, but if the author doesn't sit down and follow the process of writing, then nothing will come. Only. Now if we just wait for inspiration, then we'll be waiting for the rest of eternity. And sometimes it will come, it will stay for some time. But then we have, there has to be application to convert that inspiration also into action. So in the process of Adhana Bhakti, it is like, you know, I make sure inspiration comes every morning at 9 a.m. So it's like, we are diligent. But we also have to recognize that our diligence is only one part of it. We diligently do the activities which invoke Krishna's presence. But Krishna is Swarat, he's independent. I was talking about making our consciousness into an ocean. So we do the activities which make the which will invoke Krishna's presence, and we do them taking initiative with consistency. But Krishna is independent, and one day it may uh, his presence may manifest, another day it may not manifest. So we have to, while being diligent, also remember that the Krishna factor is not something which you can control, but Krishna factor can manifest at any moment, and if I keep that receptivity. Then I will find that uh, we will have uh, suddenly ideas coming up, which will, oh, this, this is like this, I didn't know this. So we have to have both the diligence to give doing our part and the receptivity to can understand what Krishna is conveying to us. Okay. Thank you. Very yes. Yeah, I really want to thank you, Babu. So what a wonderful night. Right. So, so and like me, I need to hear this lecture a few more times uh, because right at one point I want to, but it's too, too difficult to capture everything in this one hour. But my question, you can't kind of address it with her, but I just want to ask it. Anyway. So you gave the flight and uh, fight of energy, compare that to more of goodness or some more of passion and ignorance. So when it comes to more of goodness, so on the end of goodness where we absorb and the do the things that, like you know, mm. or take it back, step and observe, take it, let let like you know, cool down, calm down, mm. do it. However, where do you draw the line procrastination and the laziness? But on the name of the laziness and procrastination, yeah, I know, I will do it. Things may happen. Krishna did not give the chance, or did not did not give me the permission yet. Maybe only says I will do it. So we hear both of them. So where do you draw the line in order of goodness? And all the laziness of the podcast. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so how do we draw the line between mode of goodness, which involves stepping back and analyzing, and mode of, you could say, ignorance, where we're just lazy, doing nothing? 
Yes, actually, the mode of goodness and mode of ignorance appear very similar externally. <laughs> <laughs> A person in the mode of passion, you know, if a class is going on, the person in the mode of passion, when will the class end? I want to go. I want to do some things. Both in goodness and in ignorance, they just want to sit. <laughs> but in goodness, the person is sitting and hearing. The person in ignorance in the good, is either sitting and sleeping or sitting and just letting their mind wander. <laughs> So basically, if you consider that the two aspects, there is there is the external action and there is the internal contemplation. Mm -hmm. So we say that in goodness, first there is contemplation and then there is action. Mm -hmm. In ignorance, yeah. there is first action and then contemplation. <laughs> so it says some people speak to express their thoughts, and some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> They speak. Ah, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so, so in passion, there is first uh, action and then contemplation. So Krishna says, Prakasha, Pravritti, and Moha. So Prakasha is illumination. That's contemplation, then action. Pravritti is first action, then contemplation. And Moha is simply delusion. That means there is no, there is no. Uh, there is no, there is actually no proper contemplation and no proper action also. There's simply the mind is wandering here and there and we are wandering with the mind. So now, with respect to bhakti, uh, we understand that Krishna, uh, we need Krishna's mercy to do things. But at the same time, <clears throat> we also the fact that we have an opportunity to do something, that is also Krishna's mercy. There's one devotee, he is saying that we have to chant 16 rounds, but you know, our chanting is so poor. So instead of my chanting 16 rounds, can I hear Prabhupada chanting 16 rounds Japa for two hours? Now, you know, if I, now, Prabh Prabhupada has established the whole Krishna consciousness movement for us. At least we should chant. In. <laughs> so, the uh, <clears throat> that means there is, we could say, there is the facility to do a service, and then there is the facility to get the success in the service. So, the facility to get success in service is Krishna's mercy. But the facility to do the service is also Krishna's mercy. And if I don't take that facility, that means I am not taking Krishna's mercy. So we could say that if we are trying to share Krishna Bhakti with others, trying to uh, give the knowledge about Krishna to others, then just the opportunity to speak about Krishna, the opportunity to distribute books, the opportunity to give some classes, that itself is Krishna's mercy. Now people coming, people taking up the process, people becoming transformed, that is also Krishna's mercy. But if we see, when Prabhupada is marking a Bhagavad Dharma, in that song which he composed when he was in, saw the American coastline, the first line he says, Boro Kropa Kaile Krishna Adhamera Prati Ki Lagi Aani Lehata Koro Gati My dear Lord, you have been very merciful to me. You may say, what is the mercy? He's come alone, he had heart attacks, he has no money. He has no contacts, he has no followers. What is the mercy over there? But what Prabhupada is saying is, my spiritual master told me to go to the West and preach. So that I have been able to come here, that itself is Krishna's mercy. So that means we have to see that the facility to do service also is Krishna's mercy. And just because that service is not producing a result, if I give up that service, then in waiting for the second installment of Krishna's mercy, I am actually rejecting the first installment. <laughs> so, uh, my bhakti is shown by accepting the first installment itself. Like Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur would say that if nobody comes to classes, just speak to the walls. The wall, uh, the, you will get purified by that. 
So of course, we don't deliberately go in front of a wall and speak. <laughs> we do try to make sure that people come for the programs. But the principle here is that, that just speaking about Krishna is purifying for us itself. And of course, we would like others to get purified. We try to do that also. So in general, the, uh, the idea if saying that I'm dependent on Krishna is making us apathetic or lethargic about doing our service itself, then that means that is not the mode of goodness. That is actually the mode of ignorance. That is lethargy. But when I'm doing the service, what I can in my situation, and I understand that, okay, maybe in future situation changes, I'll be able to do more service. Or in future situation changes, the same service may give more results. That is Krishna's mercy. So, in general, there has to be a combination of thinking and acting. Because bhakti works both ways. It works at the internal level. It also works at the external level. Sometimes, uh, we think our way to devotional actions. Sometimes, we act our way to devotional feelings or devotional thoughts. Sometimes I just don't feel like chanting. You know, I read some quote, I hear, read some shloka, I hear some class and I start getting myself into chanting. So I think my way to devotional actions. Sometimes I just start, uh, I, sometimes I start chanting and then I start chanting then I start connecting. So I act my way to devotional emotions. Then I start feeling connected with Krishna. <laughs> so we have to work both ways. That's why for us as devotees, if we... Uh, say that I am dependent on Krishna uh, then, and that's why I am not doing this right now, then that is that could very well be simply Rithaj. Because I have to connect with Krishna in the situation I am in right now. And if I am not doing that, then I, I am not actually being connected with Krishna at all. Like some people say that, that you know, you tell them, please come to the temple. Oh, when God calls me, I'll come. You know, there is Krishna has called five thousand years ago already. Sarva Dharman Paritya Mame Kam Sharanam Vajay. Surrender to me, Krishna has said. Another way to understand is that. Actually, Krishna is calling us through his devotee. So if this devotee is telling us, then that means it's Krishna only is guiding that devotee. So basically, the <clears throat> contemplation, if it is a preparation for action, is I want to analyze, I want to prepare, but then I have to act also. But if contemplation becomes a substitute for action, then, <laughs> then it is quite likely to be indicative of the mode of ignorance. You know, if you tell somebody, you know, please give a class. Yes, I'm preparing for the class. Okay. When will you be next week? Yeah, I was preparing for one week. Oh, then one more week. Somebody says, one year I've been preparing. I'm not yet ready to give a class. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, to, you have to start off. Sometimes you have to give a class. Isn't it? So, sometimes the mind can delude us and we think that I'm preparing. But in some ways, uh, preparation is something which we do before the action. But in some ways, the action itself is the preparation also. It's like swimming. I have to get the right gear or whatever before I want to go into swim. But then ultimately, the best way to prepare for swimming is by swimming. Similarly, for us to do bhakti, the best way to do it is actually to do it. So, so we have to create some finite time scale. That Okay, I want to contemplate, I want to analyze, but for this much time. And if I'm going on and analyzing, then it is... It is I'm using the idea of dependence on Krishna as an excuse for staying independent of Krishna. <laughs> that means I don't want to serve Krishna. I'm saying I'm dependent on Krishna, but by that I am actually using that as an excuse to not connect with Krishna, to not serve Krishna. So in general, in the mode of goodness, there is contemplation before action, but there is contemplation and action both. It is not that there's only contemplation and no action at all. So when there's a combination, then we can say we are in the mode of goodness. Otherwise, if there's only one thing we are doing forever, then that is the mode of ignorance. Okay? Thank you. So, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhattarinda Ki.
Probably it's going to speak at the Sunday piece tomorrow at this conference center. And uh, the topic for tomorrow is from state of the art to state of the heart.